short of a video there, of course, from the History Channel, of course, on the famous Minotaur, of course, well-known, of course, in Greek mythology. So welcome you back, Daniel Simon uh, at Baton Rouge Community College. I uh, remember I had a great weekend, of course, overall. So, yeah, this week I'll be, you know, shifting, of course, to discuss into major civilizations, predominantly in Europe, of course, with the uh, ancient Greeks uh, in the next couple weeks or so. So, hey, welcome you back. Uh, looks like I do have a few students I know watching live uh, right now. So I've got, hey, what's up, Tristan? Uh, good morning. So he's watching. Uh, Alex, good morning also as well. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, looks like Marissa is also joining us uh, this morning along with Kelsey. Hey, what's up? And then also it looks like Samantha is also joining us uh, as, as well. So uh, before I get started, of course, my main lecture today, of course, on the Greeks, uh, I did want to talk about a few reminders, of course, about the class where we're at. Of course, you know, we're kind of around the midterm right now. Uh, of course, I am finalizing midterm grades uh, this week right now. We didn't really have a midterm uh, grade, but we did have a few assignments I know uh, that were out. Uh, like you had the India quiz, I know that's still open. I think that's going to close tonight. Uh, for most most classes, online classes, I know we're going to close. Uh, if you're like with a face-to-face -face class, I think you have till tomorrow. But uh, that 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 assignment will close tonight. So uh, if you haven't completed that or multiple temps, uh, you need, of course, to try to wrap that up. And of course, I did give you last week that little bonus assignment to do, uh, which you know is extra points for you to you know help boost up your grade. Uh, so that's something on the Great Wall of China. Uh, make sure you watch that documentary and, of course, uh, wrap up that assignment as well. Uh, that assignment, I think I'll give it a few more days uh, till maybe around Thursday or Friday, uh, but I'll give you a few more days to wrap it up. Uh, also, later in the week, uh, don't forget, uh, your, your second vocabulary is going to be due starting Friday. Just want to remind you uh, about that uh, as well. But I think those are major assignments I know we have out uh, at the moment. So anyway, uh, like I said, this week, uh, my new focus will be on the Greeks. We'll get to ancient Greece. Uh, you know, the Western culture kind of comes in at this point. Uh, mostly today, I'll, I'll, of course, focus on what they call the Aegean civilization, uh, which mostly deals with like the Minoan and the Mycenaean cultures. It's also known as sometimes the Greek Bronze Age. Uh, it's nicknamed. Uh, so you can see behind me, Right there, you've got the Acropolis with the famous Parthenon, one of the greatest architectural buildings ever constructed uh, in the world. I think right now the Greeks are trying to reconstruct part of it uh, as of now, which I think is kind of controversial, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do with that uh, when they do finish it. So, yeah, the famous, famous uh, Acropolis, of course, behind me. Uh, so if you have any comments, questions during the live stream, do let me know. Or, of course, later you can add comments on my channel. Uh, or also, uh, you can also comment, you know, send me questions or comments, of course, in Canvas discussions for, you know, students as well. All right. So, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about today, uh, of course, ancient Greece, uh, which Greece goes back, you know, thousands of years. It's not as old as the River Valley civilizations, which... I told you, go back, you know, thousands of years, back to close to about the beginning of the uh, Bronze Age. Uh, but ancient Greece is important. It is, you know, if you know about this, the first major European civilization. It's also where, you know, the birthplace of Western culture, Western civilization. So a lot of cultures in the West, you know, are highly, you know, influenced by it. Uh, you know, like Roman, the Romans later that come in, like the Roman Empire, uh, was heavily influenced uh, by by Greek culture. A lot of Western Europe was. A lot of the West, like America, like United States and other countries in the West, European countries, modern European countries today, are highly you know influenced by, of course, ancient Greece. The reason why is because you know Greece is the birthplace of things like democracy, because we know of uh, philosophy, uh, history, architecture. Uh, even di different artistic ideas uh, like plays, like the play uh, is a good example, a lot of poetry, things like that. Uh, even early scientific ideas, they think, started with the Greeks uh, a long time ago. So 
So I'll kind of get into like some of the early background of, of Greek Greek culture. Uh, and um, here's kind of a map showing you ancient uh, the area of where ancient Greece was uh, a long time ago. Uh, most of ancient Greece is like in the southeastern part of Europe. And that would be about the location of where it is, kind of located between like where Turkey is and Italy. That'd be kind of the region about where it is uh, in southern Europe. Uh, and um, it's kind of situated really around the Aegean Sea, the Aegean Basin. It's about where the majority of most of the Greek people lived, uh, although uh, some did live like around the Black Sea, uh, close to Italy, like around where southern Italy uh, and also uh, Sicily. And then some Greeks even spread westward, like towards Spain at one point. Uh, and uh, I think it was the famous uh, Greek philosopher Plato once said that the Greeks settled around the Aegean like frogs around a pond. Uh, and um, you can see all the different regions of, of Greece I'll get to later. But you got Crete on the bottom. Uh, you see there, I'll get to that later. That's where the Minoans uh, kind of begin uh, as a culture in the Bronze Age. I'll get to the Mycenaean culture, but the Mycenaean culture kind of flourishes in the southern part of Greece. Uh, you have like that peninsula on the bottom I'll get to later called the Peloponnesus. Uh, that's there. Uh, but Sparta, Argos, Corinth will kind of emerge out of there later. Athens, Thebes above that, Delphi, all those areas uh, are areas that uh, kind of start in Greece a long time ago. Like Athens is in the Attica Peninsula. Thebes and Delphi are in an area called Boeotia. Uh, and then you get up into where Mount Olympus is, uh, Thesley. I think there they call it sometimes. Uh, as well. Mount Olympus, of course, the tallest mountain uh, in Greece, um, which I think it's something like 9,500 feet tall. Uh, and then, of course, Macedonia in the north, uh, where we have Alexander the Great that emerges uh, around the 4th century. Thrace, you see up in the northern part of Greece, in the northern Aegean basin right there. Uh, Western Turkey, you've got a lot of Greeks there uh, as well. Uh, and then don't forget the islands, all the islands. There's like probably hundreds of thousands of islands throughout the Aegean. You have Greeks also living there uh, as well. So it's kind of kind of giving you an idea, perspective of, you know, of where all the different Greek peoples live uh, throughout the Aegean. Kind of like a Plato saying like frogs around a pond is kind of basically, I guess, what he said about that. Uh, they talk about sometimes uh, another thing, too, like where the term Europe came from. Uh, supposedly Europa, if you know about her, uh, she was this um, Venetian princess that supposedly where the word Europe came from like a long time ago. And uh, in, in Greek mythology, there was a story where uh, she was this princess of Phoenicia, like where Lebanon is a long time ago, uh, ancient Phoenicia. Uh, and uh, she was kidnapped by the god Zeus, uh, who disguised himself as a bull and brought her to Crete, uh, where uh, she uh, gave birth to a couple sons, which one of them was King Minos, if you know about that, uh, who was one of the kings of the, supposedly of the Minoans later. Uh, and so the word the word Europe kind of emerged from, from her name. Uh, and so I guess some people kind of view her as like almost like the mother of Europe and where the kind of the name uh, came from over time. So it's kind of the story of, of you know, where that came from. And I think Europa ends up being, you know about that, uh, one of the moons uh, of Jupiter. Uh, I think named by Galile Galileo later, uh, more closer to modern times. Now, of course, the main thing I'm going to get to today, I'm going to talk about the Greek Bronze Age, uh, which uh, is kind of a pivotal early period in uh, Greek history. It's predominantly a period... Uh, that goes back somewhere between two to 3,000 B.C. Uh, is about when it starts. Uh, it's got all kinds of names. They call it usually the Aegean civilization because you've got all these different cultures that live in and around the Aegean, like the Minoan culture, uh, the Mycenaean culture. Uh, and um, they also call it the Helladic period uh, as well. Uh, and so... I think it usually starts maybe around 3000 BC at the most, and then goes down to close to about maybe 1200 BC, 
uh, or the 12th century BC would be the time period. So the first thing I'm gonna focus on, of course, with the uh, period of the Aegean civilizations, I wanna talk about the Minoans first, that particular culture, uh, which you see right here. And uh, the Minoans uh, were a uh, considered one of the first major civilizations that emerges in Europe uh, at the time in the Bronze Age. Uh, if you know about the Minoans, uh, they were mostly a maritime culture that was dominant throughout the Aegean and part of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. And it's considered like the first link uh, in a lot of the future European civilizations that'll come along like the Greeks uh, in the Romans. You can see they started somewhere like 5,000 years ago, was believed to be, be the time period of when the Minoans existed uh, as a culture. And uh, they were actually famous for being a pretty good maritime culture that traded throughout extensively with like Egypt, Cyprus. Uh, also, they think maybe part of Turkey, Canaan, uh, and other areas. And they think they influenced people like the Greeks, uh, probably the probably the Phoenicians later, uh, to kind of you know do sea trade you know throughout that region uh, of, of of that period a long time ago. Uh, you can see images on the right. I'll get to it later, uh, but they're famous for cities they build on Crete, like Canossus, uh, which Canossus was considered to be one of the first probably European cities ever ever built, uh, which dates back, I think maybe 4,000 years ago or older. Now, I do have other, other images I'll kind of share with you. I'll get to later King Minos is famous, but uh, here's kind of an image, of course, showing the Aegean. So, yeah, they, they mostly traded probably within the Aegean Basin and probably the eastern part of the Mediterranean because uh, they, have, they have found Minoan artifacts as far east as you know, getting close to where, where Turkey and Israel is, and of course, especially, and they found a lot of artifacts from them uh, in also uh, what is uh, Egypt uh, today. Uh, this man on the left you're seeing here, Sir Arthur Evans, he's, he's a pretty important figure, of course, with early Minoan culture uh, on, on the island of Crete. Uh, if you know about him, Evans was this British archaeologist that came to Crete uh, in the 1890s. Uh, he actually knew another archaeologist named Heinrich Schliemann, who I'll talk about, who was more connected to like the Mycenaean culture in, in Troy. Uh, and he was told to go there because uh, he might find evidence of the Mycenaeans. And so he went to Crete. But if you know what happened, he found some unique culture that was different from Mycenaean. Uh, and he bought some land there where Canossus is, and he began trying to excavate it. And over time, it was, if you know about it, it was actually reconstructed, uh, the actual city uh, itself that you're looking at images uh, on the right. So you can see that area where Canossus is. And Canossus uh, is an area that's about, they think, I want to say about three acres in size. And they think the palace complex of Canossus went back at least 4,000 years ago. I think maybe 2000 BC, if maybe when some of the first palace complexes were built there uh, on Crete, uh, they think it was also a city. So it's like a city and palace complex uh, where close to 15, 20,000 people may have lived there at one point. And it was known for having a lot of rooms. I think they estimated that Canas had something like 1,300 rooms uh, actually within it, but they're not sure who built it. Some say King Minos, but they don't really know who constructed it over time, like kings. Uh, but it was probably built over many, many centuries in its construction. Uh, here's other images of it. So, yeah, you can see it's actually a, probably a palace complex that was constructed over time where they added buildings. And it does have a, a main courtyard, central court uh, that's in the middle, uh, which is about 90 by 160 feet uh, in size. And you can see it's got a lot of public buildings that are basically around it. And um, there is one section on the left that's the most famous part of it, which is the so-called throne room, uh, where some archaeologists theorize that that may have been the room where the kings of, you know, the Minoans may have, you know, sat 
Uh, although it's kind of been debated about whether it was kings that sat there or some kind of religious priestess, maybe, has also been speculated uh, as well. Uh, but you can see on the right on that image how they began later, probably early 20th century, reconstructing it of maybe what it looked like. Uh, here's kind of the interior where the throne room is right there. Uh, so you see, I'll get to it later, but Minoans were very famous for a lot of fresco paintings uh, that they painted on their you know homes and palaces and things like that. Uh, some they're very, not, very well famous for, of course, one of the first cultures to uh, do that. Here's other images. Some of, this, of course, they, they've rebuilt as well, but you can see how they have columns, which, you know, columns is something you see also like in the Egyptian world on things like that. And so uh, use of columns may have been constructed in the architecture of Canas to hold up some of the buildings uh, in general. Uh, now, one of the stories I did want to talk about that's very famous, of course, is the story of the Minotaur. Uh, if you know about this story, it's often associated with, of course, King Minos. And if you know about this, uh, when Evans went to Crete and he began excavating uh, that city of Canossus, uh, he decided to call the people of Crete in ancient times, he called them Minoan. So Minoan uh, was a term he coined uh, named after King Minos, uh, who, by the way, was, a, they think, a mythological ruler of Crete, according to the Greeks. Uh, they're not sure when he lived. They're not even sure if he was a real person or not. So that's still, you know, hotly debated about, about that. But it is considered one of the most famous stories uh, ever told uh, that is associated with ancient, you know, Crete a uh, long time ago. And uh, it's associated with this uh, legend, you know, that where there was this so-called bull creature that uh, is told by the Roman poet Ovid. He was writing this uh, in a series of, uh, you may have heard the, the book called Metamorphosis, uh, written about the first century CE, where he describes the story uh, in, of the Minotaur, which Minotaur, by the way, means uh, in, um, I guess in Greek, uh, it means bull of Minos uh, is what it means. And if you know about it, it was this mythical creature that was half bull, half man. Uh, and uh, it was eventually put into this labyrinth where it was a meat eater. Uh, they gave, you know, human sacrifices to it uh, to be eaten. And supposedly uh, in this um, labyrinth, which was part of King Minos's palace complex, uh, it was built by this famous uh, architect. Uh, named, uh, I think his name was Daedalus, uh, and uh, people that went into the labyrinth couldn't get out of it. It was like a maze, uh, and of course the manager would catch them and eat them, uh, basically. Uh, what was the deal with the story? Like, what was the origins of it? Well, according to the Greeks, uh, what happened uh, was one of the sons of King Minos had died uh, in one of the Greek games at Athens, and so in punishment, uh, they had to basically send sacrifices uh, to this um, monster, the Minotaur, to be eaten alive. Uh, I think what it was, they had to send like something like seven boys and seven girls every seven or nine years. I think it varies on how many years it was, basically. Uh, and uh, supposedly the offspring of the Minotaur, like how it got born, if you know about it, uh, there was a story where uh, the Greeks told that... Um, it was supposed to be a story where King Minos had this white bull he was supposed to sacrifice to the god Poseidon, but he wanted to keep it for himself. And so Poseidon got angry and had uh, King Minos's wife, Pasiphae, have sex with a bull. Uh, and so the offspring was this monster, uh, the Minotaur, which they put later, of course, in this uh, labyrinth. Uh, of course, also Theseus, you may have heard of him. Uh, he was supposedly in Greek mythology, the actual hero uh, that came to Crete uh, and killed uh, the Minotaur. Theseus was actually the son of the king of Athens who came as one of, I guess, the sacrifices or disguised as one of the sacrifices and was able to go into the maze and kill it. So now whether it's really a true story, they don't really know. Uh, I think they speculate that it's likely a story that the Greeks made up about the Cretans, Minoan peoples, because they were the dominant culture 
uh, off the region, and they were having to pay tribute to them. And so maybe they were also saying that the Minoans were savage, and you know the Greeks were more civilized, you know, in comparison. But they actually think that the Minoans were pretty civilized uh, as as an actual culture. So that's the story, of course, of the famous Minotaur. But they do think that bulls are a part of of Minoan culture. It's you know used a lot with they think probably religion most likely. Now whether they worship bulls as gods, I don't know. Uh, but uh, they do know it was part of games. I'll get to it later. But the Minoans had this thing called the bull jumping or bull leaping, where they would jump over the backs of bulls. Uh, so they were kind of kept as pets almost. Uh, in a sense. So maybe they kind of uh, worship them or maybe sacrifice them to their gods. Uh, of course, the thing I'll get to next and talk about is Minoan frescoes. Uh, frescoes is something that, you know, they're very famous for, uh, which they put a lot, of, you know, in their actual homes. They find them, of course, in a lot of their palaces. And uh, these were considered some of the earliest type of mural paintings that were done, uh, which were a form of uh, use of plaster, or what we call wet lime plaster, uh, which wet lime plaster is a mixture of like several things like limestone or chalk, uh, and then also sand and water, uh, which uh, the main material, I guess, if you want to know, uh, that's used is calcium hydroxide. That's mostly the main thing that's in chemicals or whatever minerals that are in limestone. Uh, and that's primarily what's used to, of course, uh, make a lot of these paintings a long time ago in the ancient world. Uh, here are examples right here. This one right here, the famous bull leaping fresco, is considered to be one of the most famous uh, frescoes ever done uh, by the Minoans. Uh, it was originally found uh, in the Palace of Canossus uh, by Evans, uh, which they think it might date back to the 15th century BC. That's kind of debated uh, today, but uh, it is famous for uh, depicting what they think was some kind of acrobatic sport uh, that was part of the Minoan world where contestants would jump over the back of the bull. I think they think that they would actually grab the bull by the horns and then jump over the back of the bull and jump off. I don't know how they grab the bull by the horns. <laughs> I wouldn't want to try that. Uh, but uh, that's something that supposedly was part of the Minoans. And I guess they, in that great courtyard, they may have put on these events, which may have been part of annual festivals that they had. And it does kind of remind you of like later uh, what we call bullfighting, which is, you know, kind of common in the modern world uh, today. They do have similar things today where they have bull leaping, where people jump over bulls and things like that. They're still doing that in Spain and other countries. I think in India, too, they do something like that uh, as well. Uh, and so it's something that's obviously part of, you know, back then and today still. Uh, so here's kind of another image shown kind of without that image at the top. But uh, there's other images, of course, like the, in also Canas, they found the famous fresco painting of the Blue Dolphins uh, as well. That's well, and I think that's also another famous one that was depicted too uh, that I guess Evans found uh, as well there. Uh, other, other ones here I've got, uh, of course, top left, I was showing you uh, the what I guess are Minoan women, uh, you know, at the time, how they dressed, uh, maybe how their hairstyles were and things like that. And uh, you'll notice that a lot of the men and women do not wear a lot of clothes, especially they go topless a lot. Even the women like expose their breasts. Uh, that's something you don't see a lot of uh, in European culture later. Uh, it's also a very warm climate, you know, in that part of the Aegean. Uh, and so um, they're not sure what those images, like the woman that's on the bottom next with those men, uh, she may have been some kind of Minoan priestess of some type, they think. They're not sure who the man is in the middle, though. I think either a Minoan priest or a Minoan prince, maybe, of some type. Uh, do you know on the right, you've got these two boys that are boxing, they think, because uh, they think that the Minoans were the ones that invented like early forms of boxing, blood sports like Greco-Roman wrestling uh, were kind of invented uh, by them. And you can see even like obviously monkeys, they find like like Canossus, 
uh, monkey paintings of monkeys on the walls. So that's obvious indication of them having some contact with parts of Africa, like trading down there on things like that. Oh, another thing that's famous too that um, Evans found at Canossus, like around 1903, uh, was the so-called Minoan snake goddess um, figurines, uh, which there's been a lot of debate about what that was uh, connected to. Some people think that it may have been connected to some kind of Minoan religion uh, or cults, like maybe a snake goddess of some type, uh, but they're not sure what that is exactly. Uh, it just has it almost seems like connections to like Egypt, maybe because you know Egypt has the goddess Isis. If you know about that, and Isis is often connected with uh, what is um, snakes as well. And Isis, you know, is a fertility goddess, and so could be it's a fertility goddess of some type, you know, associated with Minoan culture. But they're not sure exactly what what that was. But he found that too, which is quite interesting. Uh, of course, the big thing that, uh, if you know about Evans, Evans uh, was also the one that was one of the first to discover uh, the Minoan language, uh, which is called Linear A. Uh, and uh, Linear A uh, is a type of, uh, they think, pre-Greek language that they think dates back to like the 18th century BC. It may have been used for like a few hundred years, and it was predominantly written on clay tablets. Uh, which some were carved in and some were even stamped uh, as well. It used about 80 to 90 symbols uh, in the actual language, which they think it's still undecipherable, although there's been some speculation, I think, in the last couple of years that they may have cracked it, may have cracked the language and all that. But they found up to 1,400 inscriptions of these of this various language uh, that was used uh, and uh, there is one that's very famous, which is in the middle, called the Phaistos disc, which was found at one of their palaces called Phaistos, a city that's kind of south of uh, Heraclea and, and um, also uh, Canossus. And it's actually this um, six-inch wide clay tablet they discovered where it has uh, stamped um, language on it of the, of the Phoenician, of the actual, um, excuse me, the Minoan language but they're not sure what, what it is. Uh, so it's kind of a debate about what it says and you know, what it actually could be. Could actually be the actual language itself, like the alphabet or whatever uh, on it uh, stamped out. Uh, but they're really unsure about it. But they do think that linear A uh, is an early language of like later languages that we have in, in Greece, like linear B used by the Mycenaeans. And then you get old Greek, that comes in later, uh, which probably was influenced by the Phoenicians uh, as as well. Uh, of course, also the Minoans were very famous for pottery. Uh, of course, they used pottery uh, to store like wine, uh, olive oil, uh, which they think they may have exported uh, from Crete uh, in the Aegean uh, to other states, like maybe Egypt, uh, et cetera. Uh, and they also produced like a lot of wool as well. So a lot of the Greeks later, you know, were big into olive oil, wine production, uh, et cetera. Now, the one thing I did want to talk about, too, also about the Bedouins, uh, their culture uh, declined rapidly, which they think it uh, may have, they think they may have been conquered at one point by the Mycenaeans later, but they do think there was some kind of cataclysmic event that led to their demise, which they think a lot of it had to do with this uh, volcanic eruption that occurred in the southern Aegean, uh, called either the Thera eruption or it's sometimes called the uh, Minoan eruption uh, as well. And it was a volcanic eruption that occurred either in the 17th or 16th century BC. They're not sure the exact time period of when it took place, uh, but they do know where it was. It happened where the island of Santorini is, uh, which is in the southern Aegean. Uh, and I think I've got some uh, other images shown right here, a map of the southern Aegean, which is right above Crete. Uh, and um, Santorini is on the bottom of an area that they call the Cyclades. Cyclades uh, is a series of islands that are kind of between Turkey 
uh, in mainland Greece. Uh, and um, Santorini has different names. Uh, Thera uh, is a common name, uh, which uh, I think that was a name later the Greeks called it. Uh, and then Caliste, I believe, might be like an Egyptian name uh, that it was also called uh, as well. And uh, Santorini, that area was very important because the Minoans, they think, had their main uh, fleet there. Uh, and there was a port there called Acrotiri, uh, was the, I guess the nickname uh, it was called. Uh, and um, there's kind of images of Santorini, of course, with this famous white house with the blue domes on it. Santorini is a very popular site, by the way. People like to go see. A lot of, a lot of tourist ships stop there, of course, uh, in, in the Aegean. Uh, and um, uh, if you know about the actual uh, site of Akrotiri, um, it was actually discovered by this man named Spyridon Marinatos, who found it. Uh, in the 1960s, and after this volcanic eruption happened on Santorini, it buried the main port city there, like buried volcanic ash. Uh, and so in the 1960s, he began to kind of uh, uncover it and excavate it. And so they found this buried town uh, that was there. Uh, that's now like an archaeological site that you can tour uh, on, on the island of Santorini. And um, they think that the the Minoans were for those that I guess survived were forced to flee uh, when this eruption, of course, occurred. And so here, got images showing I think what was kind of some kind of fresco painting showing the actual city that was there, and of course the ships that were based there, uh, also uh, with the port uh, as well. But yeah, the whole thing was buried, uh, and. Um, they think that what happened was, uh, besides, you know, destroying the town of Akrotiri and Santorini, blowing it up, basically, uh, it also sent tsunamis that hit, basically, Crete. And they think Crete was wiped out uh, because of this volcanic eruption uh, that occurred. And uh, some people think that the decline of the Minoans has often been connected to, of course, the story of Plato's Atlantis, uh, where uh, the famous Greek philosopher in the fourth, fourth century told of a story of this so-called fictional island and civilization that was supposed to be very advanced, like more advanced than the Greeks were like a long time ago. And uh, according to Plato, uh, Atlantis existed something like almost a thousand years uh, before they did, and it disappeared into the sea when there was some kind of like I think it was almost like a volcanic eruption that happened or something like that. Uh, and so for years, people thought that there was some kind of connection between the story of Atlantis uh, and the Minoan culture. And they think that's might, might be where the famous story came from, uh, from a long time ago. So that is an interesting connection with that. Although if you know about the Greeks, the Greeks thought that the uh, Atlantis was actually to the West, like close to where the Atlantic Ocean is uh, and all that. Uh, but they probably thought that it was somewhere else and not in the same vicinity. So that's the that's what happened, of course, with the Bedouins. They think that because of all that, the, they'll get to the mice. The mice and Ians were able to come in uh, and eventually take over Crete. And they believe that the Bedouin culture was then absorbed into the mice and Ian culture. And that's the next thing I want to get into uh, and talk about today uh, is the mice and Ian culture. Uh, the Mycenaean culture was kind of a continuation of the Greek Bronze. It kind of happens in the uh, the late Greek Bronze Age. Uh, we can see 16th to about the 12th centuries BC is about when it was. Uh, they mostly lived in the Greek mainland, but also uh, they inhabited Crete, uh, probably the Cyclades uh, as well. And uh, the Mycenaean culture was different from Minoan. The Minoans were more of a maritime, kind of a peaceful type culture, uh, as the, the uh, Mycenaeans were not. They were more warlike uh, as a culture, uh, and uh, they built similar cities to what the, Min the Minoans built, uh, but they built more like fortified cities uh, that were built on hilltops. 
what they call it Acropolis. They had also palace complexes like the Minoans did, but they built like walls around their cities, uh, and the Minoans did not. Uh, That's kind of one of the differences between the two, uh, two different cultures. Uh, they do think the Mycenaean culture probably absorbed a lot of the Minoan culture. So they don't think the Mycenaean culture was an original culture. I think I've heard sometimes they call it kind of like a retrograde culture uh, that absorbed other ideas uh, from other people. And um, they are ruled by these warrior type kings I'll get to later, uh, which are called a Waynax. Uh, and uh, it'll be kings like Agamemnon, uh, Manelaus, uh, Achilles, Odysseus, uh, kings you hear about uh, in the stories of Homer. So those are the kind of kings that you uh, really get to kind of know uh, from that time period. Uh, Evans uh, also coined the actual language of the Mycenaeans. Uh, it's later dubbed Linear B. Uh, so it's kind of believed to be some kind of pre-Greek writing system that kind of uh, surpassed Linear A. Uh, it may have been influenced uh, by Linear A, uh, but they do think it was one of these kind of early pre uh, you know, in, Indo-European languages in that region that eventually led to later the later Greek language, Old Greek, uh, which probably evolved from Linear A, Linear B, uh, and probably Phoenician influences. Now, I've got other images kind of right here uh, on the right, of course. Uh, so, yeah, they do think that Minoan culture was probably assimilated uh, into Mycenaean culture, they think at least by about 1400 uh, BC. So Crete was invaded, uh, and what was left of the Minoans was destroyed uh, by them. And you can see that the Mycenaeans became like the middlemen. Well, again, a lot of the trade throughout that region as well. And they had different cities that were famous, Mycenae, Tyrans, they think Athens, Thebes, Pylos, and other cities maybe even early Sparta, uh, may have kind of started uh, at that point uh, in time uh, during, the, during the Bronze Age. And they're not sure the actual name of the Mycenaean culture. I think I'll get to it later, but Homer says they're, they're called Achaean uh, is the other name, uh, but their, their name is really unknown. Just like the Minoan culture, they don't know what they were called either. They're called Minoans or Cretans, of course, uh, sometimes in modern times. So, yeah, uh, the Mycenaeans you see in this slide, yeah, they emerge, of course, in the Greek mainland and build these, you know, palace complex uh, with these fortress-type cities that are famous. Uh, and uh, because of the city of Mycenae, that's, that's part of why later they're called Mycenaeans, because Mycenae uh, was considered the most powerful of these different, I guess, city-states that started emerging uh, throughout, uh, you know, Bronze Age Greece at the time. And it was located in the northeastern part of the Peloponnese or Peloponnesus Peninsula in what is now the southern part of the Republic of Greece. Uh, and um, you can see images, of course, on the right, kind of depicting, uh, you know, the, the actual city of Mycenae, which I told you these cities were heavily fortified, of course, uh, in, in the Bronze Age. Uh, there's kind of an image of Linear B, by the way. Linear B, uh, I think, used up to 200 symbols or more, and it has been deciphered, at least as far as they know. They've been able to decipher a lot of the language. Uh, and so Linear B is kind of like the link uh, between uh, like early Greek civilizations uh, and, of course, the ones that will kind of come in the Iron Age uh, with Old Greek, like Ionic or Doric Greek uh, that comes later. They think that probably, I said, Phoenician, the Phoenician language probably had a big influence on how, how the Greek language evolved into it, what it is later. I think there's even a theory that part of why the Greeks developed a language was to write down Homer's epics and all that. Uh, here's kind of an image of what ancient Mycenae looked like a long time ago. So they think it might date back to the 16th century BC. 
uh, when the city was founded a long time ago. So you can see it was a fortified city. It was built like a palace complex, you know, similar to what the Minoans were like Canossus uh, on Crete. Uh, but like I said, they don't think the Minoans had fortifications uh, as far as they know. And uh, the Mycenaeans are very famous for a lot of early Greek architecture. I'll get to it later, but the famous Lion Gate is probably the most famous thing associated with Mycenae. Uh, I'll get to the so-called Cyclopean masonry they used to build a lot of their buildings and walls. Uh, a lot of palace complex were constructed, too, uh, in that Greek Bronze Age. They also had a lot of elaborate tombs and graves that they found that were also found at that site and other sites in the region. Uh, here's kind of an aerial view, of course, of the ruins of Mycenae. So parts of it have been kind of rebuilt. And of course, uh, they think back in the 1800s, archaeologists first came there and started doing excavations uh, at that site. But they think people had known about Mycenae going back probably hundreds and hundreds of years. Here's other images, uh, which are right here, showing, of course, some of the walls uh, at Mycenae. Uh, and um, here's the most famous feature they always talk about, especially architectural feature uh, associated with uh, Mycenae, uh, which is the so-called Lion Gate uh, that's there. Uh, and uh, they think the Lion Gate is some type of main entrance. And I think that they think that Mycenae had two main entrances uh, into the city, uh, so-called Postern Gate. That one's not as important, but the Lion Gate, they think, may have been the main entrance uh, into it. And it is considered one of the first famous architectural feature you see in the Greek world. It's almost like an early type of arch. You see Greco-Roman arch uh, being built there. It has a coat of arms, which is at the top, which are these two lionesses uh, with the stone column uh, in the middle. Uh, and they're not sure what that could be. Maybe it's a coat of arms for the actual family uh, that ruled Mycenae. Uh, maybe the house of Atreus, uh, you know, King Atreus, who they think may have been one of the kings uh, that ruled there, uh, and his son Agamemnon uh, and Menelaus uh, later. Uh, but um, the, lion, the Lion Gate, um, here's kind of another image uh, right here. Uh, you can see what's interesting about a lot of the architecture at Mycenae and other uh, similar sites. They tend to stack up a lot of their stone, uh, which they often call it Cyclopean walls or Cyclopean masonry. Uh, and uh, what it is, it's, it's basically where they take stones and boulders and kind of stack it up uh, without using any lime mortar. So it's like no kind of like cement being used uh, between uh, the gaps uh, in walls. Uh, and uh, I think the joke was the one-eyed monster uh, Cyclops built it or something like that, giant. Uh, and so that's kind of where the name came from, which is right uh, you know, right there. So yeah, you can see more of a close-up view of the actual coat of arms with the two lions uh, right there with the, uh, I guess, Ionic column, that's I guess a Doric column that's in the middle, actually. But um, other features, too. Here's kind of another image showing the Cyclopean masonry, by the way. So they really stack up these small boulders uh, or, or stones, uh, you can see uh, with that. Here's another image showing how the Cyclopean masonry uh, that they also used. I'm sure some of this has been kind of rebuilt uh, to wait, I guess, what it looked like. Now, they have this man that's very famous associated with Mycenae, and later Troy, if you know about it, named Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann uh, is a very important archaeologist uh, with Mycenae, and he's kind of considered like a pioneer uh, in Mycenaean uh, architecture. And uh, if you know about Schliemann, he's uh, German, uh, originally goes back to the 19th century, and uh, he was originally a businessman uh, who did a lot with, like, merchant stuff and uh, he actually at one point came to the United States uh, and was involved in the California gold rush. So he was very wealthy, probably a millionaire. 
uh, at the time. But Schleiman uh, was big into archaeology. Uh, in fact, he was kind of self-learned. Uh, and so he was this amateur archaeologist that was very interested uh, in the early Greek Bronze Age. Uh, and so he later went on to do a bunch of excavations at those three sites the most, uh, Mycenae, Troy, and Tyrens, which is in also in Greece. Uh, and that was done in the 1870s uh, when all this was going on. Uh, and uh, Schliemann, Schliemann um, believed uh, that the works of Homer, who wrote uh, the famous epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which talk about the Trojan War period uh, and what they think was Mycenaean uh, you know, history, um, he thought that the epics of Homer were actually real like based on historical truths or historical events that actually happened. Uh, and uh, I think Schliemann, um, if you know about him, uh, he he was just a great lover of Homer. In fact, he, I think he had memorized both the Iliad and the Odyssey. He could actually recite both of them by heart from memory and in Greek, uh, by the way. I think he was one of these type of men that knew multiple languages, like many languages he could speak. Uh, and so he was a very, very intelligent man, but never college educated. He didn't go to any kind of university or anything like, like that. And so he was an amateur archaeologist. But he's kind of considered a pioneer uh, in early archaeology, which a lot of early archaeology, you know, was there were really no schools for it originally back in the 1800s. You kind of learned it on the trade, uh, more or less. Uh, here's some images of some things that were excavated, of course, uh, at Mycenae that's well known. You may have heard about the famous uh, Tholo tombs uh, that are there. Uh, the Tholos tombs are the so-called, they call them beehive tombs, is what they're usually called, which Tholos is, like I think, the Greek word for beehive. These are beehive-shaped tombs that the Mycenaeans built to bury their kings. Uh, and they would put, like, tr elaborate treasures within it uh, as well. And uh, the one you're looking at right here uh, is often called the Treasury of Atreus, uh, which they think may have been built uh, in the 13th century, if that's really true, when the, around when the Trojan War happened right there. And so they may have put the king in there, and probably some of his treasures were, were put in it uh, also. And they think, like, like I told you, uh, Atreus, King Atreus, uh, was the father of King, the later kings, Agamemnon, in Menelaus uh, that are mentioned by Homer uh, in, in the Iliad. Here's kind of an entrance of what a Tholos tomb looked like. Uh, and so they would actually bury these tombs like underground, uh, but they were built with stones that were stacked up using that same kind of method, uh, that Cyclopean masonry we talked about. I don't think they used much mortar between the actual stones. It would create kind of a beehive dome shape. It's also called dome dome tombs uh, as well. And so that's kind of what the inside of it looked like. Uh, I think that's the treasure of Atreus that you're looking at. Here's kind of an image of what the top of the dome uh, looks like. So it's kind of an earlier dome. You see a lot like in the Roman world, Greco-Roman Greco world, they built like, you know, dome-shaped buildings that you have. But that's something that kind of goes back to early Greek and even Egyptian times. They have some kind of things like that going on. It's more like corbeling uh, is what it really is, where you got stones kind of going up until it kind of makes almost like a round arch uh, at the top. Uh, another thing that uh, Schliemann was involved in uh, later, it's very famous at Mycenae, he, he excavated primarily uh, a bunch of graves there, uh, Grave Circle A uh, and Grave Circle B. Uh, which uh, these were believed to be royal cemeteries of the Mycenaeans, like the nobility, uh, they were put there, and uh, they employed what they call a shaft grave, where they would dig a shaft down, they would bury people on the bottom. Uh, and um, the one you're looking at, Grave Circle A, is really the one that's the most famous one uh, that was found there. Uh, they also have another, which is Grave Circle B, uh, as well. Not as famous as the other one, uh, but he did find artifacts in them that are famous. A lot of, lot of uh, gold artifacts were found in it, which especially they found a bunch of these death masks uh, actually buried uh, in the graves. And uh, the, one, the one that he's 
the most famous he found uh, in the 1870s uh, was the Mask of Agamemnon, uh, which uh, was actually found, I think, I want to say in 1876, I think, when he discovered it. Uh, and um, he thought it looked like Agamemnon or something like that, or could be. And so he kind of gave it that nickname, but they don't know who it is, who the actual death mask is of some kind of My Mycenaean uh, nobleman of, of, of type. Uh, and uh, but they did bury a lot of trinkets in it, cups and other things, jewelry. Uh, I think they found daggers. Uh, I think a lot of their weapons and their armor, I think, were buried in them with them. But you see, so these are some of the gold artifacts that were, of course, found uh, in the actual graves uh, at, at the site of Mycenae back in the 19th century. Uh, now, the big thing I did want to talk about that's real famous about the Mycenaeans, of course, is this connection, you know, with the Trojan War. They think that the Mycenaean culture was somehow involved uh, in the Trojan War, although they're not called Mycenaean, if you know, they're called Achaean, is the common name that Homer mentions, of course, uh, in the Iliad. Uh, and um, the Trojan War, if you know about it, uh, was believed to have been a mythological war uh, that they think either dates back to the 13th or the 12th century BC. They're not sure if that's really the time period, although 1250, I think, seems to be kind of a peak period of maybe when it happened, if it did. Mythological, though. So some people think it didn't happen, you know, the war. But um, they do think it was a war between the Greeks uh, in, like, the mainland and then the Trojans, which were some kind of people uh, that lived in northwestern Turkey. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about who the Trojans were. They think they still don't know who they were. They don't think they were Greeks, although it seems like they're worshiping gods like the Greeks. Seems like it. Uh, maybe Homer thought they were. Uh, but uh, these people uh, were believed to have lived uh, at a site, uh, which I'll kind of show you right here. Let me go down here real quick here. But there's a site called Hisarlik, which... Uh, was found supposedly by uh, archaeologists in the 19th century, 18, going back to early 1800s, which is in northwestern Turkey. Uh, this site uh, is believed to be uh, the ancient site of Troy. Uh, and um, I think it's part of the, back then, of course, the Ottoman Empire at the time. Uh, but uh, Hisarlik is a Turkish name that means place of fortifications or place of fortresses, and they do think that this site was evidently used as a heavily fortified city uh, to protect that part of Turkey, which is close to the Aegean Basin and the Dardanelles Strait. Uh, so it had some kind of significance uh, with maybe trade, uh, especially between east and west. You know, you know a lot of trade kind of goes through there later, you know, uh, especially up to Greco-Roman times. Uh, and so Schliemann, they think Schliemann came there in the 1870s and began excavating that site. And so a lot of archaeologists think that Hisarlik might be the site of where, you know, Troy was uh, at one point. But let me get back to the Trojan War, a little bit about it, uh, more history. So they think that Homer, Homer, uh, you know, like I said, was the one that wrote about, Homer was, you know, famous Greek poet. Uh, that they think lived either in the 9th century B.C., some say 8th century B.C. Uh, as well. The Greeks simply called him the poet. Uh, if you know about that, he's considered the greatest poet uh, in Greek history. But they're not sure if he was a real person or not. I think the Greeks thought he was some kind of barred, blind poet you know, that sang these songs about the Trojan War uh, and also the story of of Odysseus, you know, the Odyssey uh, later. Uh, Herodotus claims that he lived about maybe the ninth century. So they, they seem to think that's about when maybe uh, he lived uh, overall. And uh, Homer seems to think that this so-called 10-year war uh, was started because of the fact that a Trojan prince by the name of Paris took Helen of Troy uh, from uh, the Spartans she was actually the um, queen, the queen of 
uh, and wife of King Menelaus of Sparta. Uh, and so that sparked the war that lasted 10 years. And I think it was Christopher Marler that once remarked that it was the so-called face that launched a thousand ships, you know, held of Troy uh, because of that whole issue. Uh, and so that, that caused Agamemnon and Menelaus to join up and eventually, you know, the two two sides, the, the Greeks and the Trojans, did did battle. Yeah, here's some of the famous uh, figures that were kind of involved, of course, uh, with the Trojan War in the story of the Iliad. Uh, of course, uh, like I said, Paris, uh, Hector, you see the two on the right, they were considered the two main sons of Priam. Priam was the king of Troy uh, and um, those are considered some of the major characters that are, of course, on the Trojan side uh, in the war. Uh, Paris, you see there, is holding kind of an apple that's kind of famous. Uh, according to Homer, uh, there was a quarrel among the goddesses uh, over which goddess was the most fairest. Uh, and so uh, there was this thing where they had the judgment of Paris, where uh, Paris was given what they call the golden apple golden apple of discord. And so he chose Aphrodite as the fairest of the different goddesses. And so what happened was Aphrodite gave Helen of Troy uh, to Paris as a prize. Uh, and so I guess depending on what side you're on, the Greeks thought he kidnapped her and the Trojans thought she went willingly uh, with him. Uh, Hector, then on the right you see, of course, uh, is considered to be uh, the greatest hero, like warrior, of course, of the Trojans. Uh, he's, of course, the one that later is killed by Achilles, of course, in battle. Uh, then other figures you see there, you got King Atreus. Uh, he's the father, of course, of King Ag Agamemnon, who's the king of Mycenae. Uh, Agamemnon's the most famous character, really, uh, that leads uh, the Greek forces uh, against the Trojans. And then he's got a brother, of course, Menelaus, who's the king of Sparta uh, also. Uh, but you do have other characters, too, uh, that they have, uh, which are like Achilles, of course, a major character uh, also uh, in the Iliad. He's considered to be the greatest warrior or hero uh, on the Greek side. He's one that's famous for fighting Hector and killing him uh, in single combat. And don't forget Odysseus, the king of Ithaca. He was also involved uh, in the Trojan War. It's also the main character in Homer's uh, The Odyssey, uh, which discusses his journeys back home after the war. Odysseus is the one also, they think, came up with the Trojan horse idea as well. Yeah, of course, they have that image, you know, like a lot of stories they talk about, a lot of Greek stories, uh, how there was this Trojan horse uh, that was used uh, to basically uh, take the city of Troy. Uh, they're not sure if that's really a true story or not. The Homer doesn't really mention anything about a Trojan horse. Uh, it's something that is mostly goes back to writers like the Roman poet Virgil uh, mentions it in his epic, the Aeneid, uh, in the first century BC. It's kind of debate about what it was. Uh, it may have been a siege engine. Uh, they think so you, I think there's been some theories. It may have been a battering ram uh, also as well. Uh, but Odysseus supposedly used it uh, to put forces inside of it uh, where they brought it into the city and they're able to sack the city from within. Uh, it's basically how, of course, that's done. And so it's kind of like a Trojan horse virus. Kind of gets in your computer and wipes it out from the inside. They say that's what happened. Uh, but they're not sure if that's what really occurred with the war or not at the end. Uh, they do find later that from archaeological digs uh, at the site of Hisarlik uh, in Turkey that parts of the city was burned. Uh, that's something they did find evidence of, but they're not sure if it's connected to that story uh, or not. So still kind of debated about that. But yeah, there's the image of Virgil, the idea. We'll talk more about Virgil later when we get more to the like, Roman period, but we've already kind of mentioned him before when we were talking about Carthage and all that. Uh, oh, one thing that is very famous, too, also, uh, Schliemann did find this thing called Priam's treasure, by the way, uh, at the site. 
uh, which was found in the 1870s. And Priam's treasure was some kind of uh, treasure that was found in actually the walls of his sarling that he kind of dug out, uh, which I think was, I want to say, in 1873 uh, is when it is. I do have some other images of it. Uh, and uh, it is kind of controversial because uh, if you know about Schleiman, he stole it a lot from Turkey. Like it was under the Ottoman Empire and snuck it out of their country and brought it to Germany. And uh, during World War II, uh, the Soviet forces took Berlin. They took the actual Priam's treasure back to the Soviet Union. And now it's in Russia is where most of the artifacts are today. I think it's in the Pushkin Museum is where it is now. Uh, but they're not sure if it's connected to the same time period or not. Uh, I think they've done some carbon-14 dating on it. It doesn't seem to match uh, the period of the Trojan War. It might be older, going back to 2000 BC. So it's kind of a debate about whether that's really Trojan artifacts or not. There's other sites, just, of course, looking at the site of ancient Asarlik. It's about uh, the size of Asarlik. It's about on a uh, it's on an artificial hill, which is called a tell, uh, about 50 feet tall. And they think it's about an area of about 60, 650 feet area is about where most of the main buildings are, but on several acres uh, that you're looking at. But they think that uh, a man named Frank Colbert came there originally, a British archaeologist, and he gave Schleiman the idea uh, to excavate there. And so Schleiman came there in the 1870s and did most of his work there. Uh, by the way, they think that Troy was actually nine different cities at one point. Yeah, seriously, Troy won uh, through Troy nine at one point. They think maybe Troy seven might be actually where Troy might have been, uh, which Troy has different names. Uh, the Greeks called it Ilios or Ilion. I think the Romans called it Ilium uh, also, uh, but it does have different names uh, that it's nicknamed. That's maybe what it looked like. Uh, but uh, Schleiman was controversial at the site. Uh, he used dynamite, if you know about this, in a lot of his excavations. And so, yeah, he really was an amateur archaeologist, uh, in a sense. Uh, archaeologists don't use dynamite anymore. <laughs> that kind of thing. There's other images showing, like, the walls that may have been, uh, you know, Troy. Seems kind of small for Troy, though. Troy's you know, in Homer's Iliad, seems huge, like gigantic. On uh, this site, it's not really that large uh, in comparison, maybe. So here's other images, uh, which, are, of course, are, are also uh, right here. But yeah, I'm going to get to it later, but uh, we'll talk about also the rise of the Greek city-states. Uh, but, yeah, uh, What's going to happen later? The Mycenaean culture is going to decline. Now, they think sometime around the 13th century, uh, you get this late Bronze Age collapse that occurs uh, in the Mediterranean world. It happens about the same time when the Sea Peoples invade the region. We've, we've talked about the Sea Peoples uh, before. Uh, there's speculation that the Trojan War may have been somehow connected uh, to the Sea Peoples' invasions. Uh, whether which one was the Sea Peoples, they don't know, uh, but it's a possibility because cities like in Turkey, like Atusa, were destroyed, just like Troy was destroyed. Uh, and so uh, it's a possibility that that's the same kind of time period that we're talking about. But I'll we'll get to it later. Uh, there is a period called the Greek Dark Ages uh, that comes in uh, where Greece in the early Iron Age kind of struggles uh, after the Bronze Age collapse, and you get the rise of the Greek city-states uh, that emerge like around the 8th century BC. So later in the week, I'll be, you know, moving on to talk about, of course, that topic also on ancient Greek Greece as well. So that's my main lecture, of course, my first lecture on ancient Greece. Uh, I did want to say uh, hello, of course, to Christian. Why? Hey, Christian, what's going on? Hope you had a great morning. Uh, also, uh, also Kayla looks like had joined us earlier uh, as well, and then Becky also had joined us uh, as well. Sorry about I missed you, of course, uh, earlier uh, this morning when you came in. So, 
Uh, that's it. Don't like I have any uh, historical comments or questions, of course. But if you do have a comment, question, of course, uh, about this lecture or any other lecture, do let me know, of course, uh, either on my channel or also in Canvas discussions. Uh, like I said, we'll be moving on uh, later in the week to talk about the rise of the Greek city-state. So I'll get into and I'll talk especially about Athens and Sparta. Those two uh, city-states were really uh, the most famous uh, really in, in ancient Greece at that time. Uh, we'll talk a lot about the, of course, famous Acropolis with the Parthenon uh, behind me uh, as well. So that's it for today. Uh, I'll, of course, see you uh, you know later in the week. Uh, but like I said, don't forget about uh, some of those last assignments. Uh, the, of course, one y'all definitely need to kind of wrap up, of course, uh, is the one on ancient India uh, lectures. Uh, try to wrap that up, of course, uh, tonight. So y'all take care. I'll see you, of course, uh, later in the week.